Your book is fantastic, and it's so gorgeously written. And I know that you you're obviously an accomplished writer as well. How very um, kind. Thank you. No, it's no a problem. Book. Thank you. <laughs> Tell me about I'm really the extremely flattered and pleased to hear that. Really. Well, th- well, tell me about the experience of writing it because w- was it was it for you painful or challenging or cathartic in some way or all of the Everything, above? What, all of yeah. that, all of the above. Um, the difficulty at first was to know how to how much to say, how much not to say, and how to say it. Mm-hmm. And I was. Um, uh, wondering, I started it thinking I'm going to be very terse and just say things and move on, and without any emotion. And then a friend of mine said, "This is too dry. You've got to let your emotions come through and and give us a bit of dialogue if you can." Mm-hmm. And so, little by little, I loosened up and became a little more natural in the writing. But uh, as English is not my mother tongue, I was always very um, nervous about uh, having the sentences well turned out, so to speak. Well, if it's you not did your a... mother tongue, you're definitely doing a lot better than 99% of the population here. Okay. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> because it's such an emotional journey, your, your life, uh, just tremendous highs and... And, and lows, of course, but it's so beautifully expressed, and, and I, I'm, I'm thankful that you that you did write it emotionally because it is an emotional journey. Um, w- would you say, going back to the beginning of that journey, would you say that your mother was probably the primary influence on your life? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I she, admired her very, very much. She was very compelling and and rather charismatic. And she was one of those people who uh, who, who draw uh, concern from you. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone was always concerned that she was comfortable, that she was well enough, that she was mm-hmm. happy. Uh, everybody in the home was very concerned for her always. Mm-hmm. And uh, I realized later that I spend my entire life trying to to reach her uh, to, to reach her heart, to please her, to get approval from her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which uh, I didn't really get. Uh, I got it from my father, but never from my mother. And even as she died, I understand she left a note which my brother was kind enough to destroy. Mm. But uh, she she was, on the one hand, very generous and and took a great deal of pains to put me on the right track. And on the other hand, she resented it when I became famous. Because she she came from a creative... Uh, performance background as well, didn't she? She was very creative. And if you look at the one picture of her in the book, she mm-hmm. is exquisite. She was, she had really remarkable potential. And I read her critics as a book of her, uh, of her newspaper clippings, and she really had enormous uh, admiration from the critics. She could have had a beautiful career. Is, is I picture, guess... What? Is it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is the picture you refer to the one in the Vegas costume? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's an that's a, that's a exquisite photograph. Exquisite, and she designed and had the costume made, and she designed the, uh, the ballet. Wow. Yeah. She was the choreographer, so she was really extremely talented. And I think the rest of her life, when she gave up her work, when she gave up being a performer, uh, was a bit of a letdown, especially when the war started and there was no more social life in Mm -hmm. Paris. 
Well, you were actually uh, working on the stage in, in, in the ballet. Um, is that where Gene Kelly uh, first became aware of you? He saw me dance on the opening night of the ballet where I was representing the Sphinx and with Jean Babillet playing Oedipus. Mm -hmm. And it was a very fashionable evening, very Parisian, and Gene Kelly was in the audience. I didn't meet him that night, but I met him uh, maybe a year later when he came to Paris looking for me and looking to, wanting to make a test with me. Wow. You see, I didn't know about backstage protocol. <laughs> I didn't know you were supposed to wait backstage for <laughs> for people to come and congratulate you. I doubt that anyone would have come backstage anyway. I, I, you know, I was just fresh out of the chorus, so mm -hmm. I didn't know all those things. And I've gone how, home. How aware of you at that time, how aware were you of Gene Kelly and the, and the, the musical film and they the whole Hollywood possibly, machine? Not at all. I mm -hmm. had never seen a musical. I didn't know who Gene Kelly was. I'm not even sure whether I had seen a Fred Astaire film. I don't think so. You wow. see, during the war, of course, we didn't have it, American films. Right. Mm -hmm. And this was, I left in 1950, so there was still five years. But I don't remember seeing a Gene Kelly film, no. Wow. One of the great pleasures of the book, though, uh, is reading your recollections of just these giant talents uh, that you've worked with throughout your career. Oh, yeah. And so, of course, I have to ask about Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire, because these are the two giants we most closely associate with the, the movie musical. Uh, and I'm wondering, from your perspective, how, how those two gentlemen were, were, were different and similar, and, and what were the dynamics of, of partnering with them? Well, a good, par a great partner is a great partner. Mm -hmm. But, uh, for instance, Fred Astaire never did any lifts. He was of another era. Uh, he danced ballroom dancing, mm -hmm. and uh, it was all a matter of rhythm and charm, uh, but and speed and uh, very, very amusing to do. But there wasn't, there weren't the lifts, and of course I, I didn't. Yeah, there's a little moment where we do, where I do two with him. But mm -hmm. on the whole, uh, although I, I did that with Jean, but I didn't. Jean had had ballet training mm -hmm. to begin with, so Jean was closer to to ballet. However. His influence was Jack Cole. I don't know if that name still means something. Jack Cole was a very famous choreographer in the 50s, mm -hmm. and he trained uh, Jeannie Coyne, for instance, who was Jean's assistant, and who became the star of Pajama Game. Mm -hmm. And so the dancing with Jean was quite inspired by, quite a bit inspired by, that sort of technique, Jack Cole, and uh, much more athletic. And Jean was somebody who liked to dance with boys as well as girls. Mm -hmm. I don't mm -hmm. think Fred uh, danced with boys very much. Well, when when I read about of your accounts with Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire and Cary Grant and all mm -hmm. these giants, uh, they always seem like such larger than life personalities to me and I'm curious they because not. they were not they were human beings uh, with uh, their great qualities but mm. sometimes with, it, with their flaws just like I was and uh, for instance Carrie would get sometimes into a terrible tantrum and uh, also Jean also once in a while got into a bad mood <laughs> Uh, you know what I think? I think it is though, and, and you've been in the business for, for for many years, and you have seen the the dynamics of the business change. 
I think back then the, the studio the studio system uh, when you started in films, there was a certain from the public standpoint a certain mystique that seems to yes. be missing today. The studio oh. worked on that. The studio worked on creating a grand image of somebody superlatively beautiful and talented, mm -hmm. which they don't anymore. Mm. Uh, no, they people, don't. People can be represented as everyday people. Right. You right. see them uh, not all that well-groomed, dragging children around and uh, barefooted and whatever. Uh, you did. You you would never see that. No, the, the studio the protected the image and presented their stars as gods and goddesses of the Olympus, mm -hmm. and you were groomed, told, and protected, and defended from doing that sort of thing. It right. was it, 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 off rules. You you were reprimanded. I think if if you were seen or photographed uh, in a in, in in an unflattering manner. Actually, there was such a tight control between the studio and the newspapers. The studio, if the newspapers had a, a caught something that was not flattering, uh, they were checked by the studios and their future on the studio lot was threatened if they published something unflattering. You see how it went. Mm -hmm. There was a control between the studio and the press. And there was a control also when we gave interviews. There was somebody from the studio there to make sure that we never got uh, questions that were embarrassing, that could be uh, that could harm our image and all that sort of thing. Right. It took me many years to learn to be independent and say what I thought without being afraid of being checked. There was this really heavy control from the studio. Well, it, it, it's, it seems like I'm, – I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, just one second. But yeah, it, sure. just to follow on that point, it, it seems that it, it took uh, tremendous uh, courage for you to – uh, kind of break free of that and establish your own identity. I, I know that there was an account uh, of you walking into the office. Was it Mayor that you walked into the office of? And Dory Sherry. Yes. Dory yes. Sherry. By then, Mayor had been eased out. <laughs> and it was <laughs> Dory Sherry who was head of the studio. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, it's a funny story, isn't it? It's a great story. Oh, it's one of many great stories in your book. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. You had a question? Well, before we go, I wanted, I wanted to just ask, because we've asked about all these giants that you work with, but the two giants that I wanted to ask were with, of course, and one of my favorite films of yours is Lily with Mel Ferrer. Yes. Uh, as we, we've been talking about Lily at my house uh, for the last week, because it's just a magical movie. And I was just curious what, what what it was like to work with someone like Mel Ferrer. Well, uh, Mel was quite independent, and uh, I I tell a story. Uh, he he was quite temperamental, and uh, I think uh, the director had to call him. Uh, you know. To, to calm down, to calm him down, because Mel was uh, being a little difficult at one point. Don't you remember that story? At <laughs> mm -hmm. how the yeah. the two of them got into a dressing room, we could hear shouting, and then uh, Chuck Walters, the director, walked out with a smile on his face, and everything was smooth from that moment on. Mel was was not. Uh, what, I tell you, Mel was used to being a director, right? And he, I think he found it difficult to be directed, mm -hmm. and that can happen to to some actors. True. But he had a great compassion, great heart, and and was a wonderful actor. So uh, all that comes through, and I think it's one of his best parts.
Right. Oh, without a doubt. The other person that you work with who is probably the, the big giant here is Jean Renoir. What was that like? What was that relationship like? Jean Renoir, the, the, direct, the great director. One of the greats of, the 20, of any century, for that matter. Yeah, he was, he was one of the early, early ones. He started in Silent Days. Mm-hmm. Well, Jean Renoir, now you're speaking of uh, someone who is, for me, like a father and like right. a mentor and somebody I loved very dearly and who had a great influence in my life. He, he had a great human experience, uh, I suppose, from his father... Uh, who was the painter, and uh, he had a different philosophy of life from most people. Right. Everything was extremely natural. For instance, he wanted natural sound in his films, and he didn't do uh, he didn't do uh, dubbing. If he had somebody singing in a scene, he wanted it to be direct. He liked flaws. He li- he believed the flaws were part of the character mm-hmm. and were welcome. And as a person, he he was just very generous. And uh, although he had this uh, rem- remarkable inter. <coughs> intellectual capacity he was also capable of talking of he's the one person who would point to his tree his olive tree and say look how well he's recovering Mm. and pointed to clouds in the sky and say look at those beautiful clouds today Wow. Mm. you know he he had a very broad vision of life and people right. and also he was the one person I've met in the world who never said an unkind word about anyone and I tell this amusing story of the name of someone coming in a conversation and he couldn't think of anything nice to say about him except that he was the strongest man I met he could <laughs> lift a chair from one <laughs> <laughs> With, with, you know, with one um, one leg of the chair, and it, it occurred to me at that point that he was talking about such an imbecile he couldn't think of anything else. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, be- before I let you go, uh, I-, I just wanted to know. I know that you're uh, about to take the stage uh, again for the Sondheim uh, uh, musical, oh, yes. a little a little night music with Kristen Scott Thomas. Yeah. Uh, and I'm curious, you've you've been performing for most of your life. Yes. Uh, does does performance now does it give you a different kind of satisfaction than it did in years previous? Yes, very much so. I think I come on the stage with a feeling that people are here because they want to see me, not because they want to catch me at being bad. <laughs> when, I, when I first went on the stage, I was so convinced that I wasn't good enough. Uh, that caused a lot of anxiety. But now I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's enough good to satisfy those people. I try my best, and there it is. That's all I can do. And I'm... I'm enjoying being here with all those people and doing a beautiful piece of, of work.